Hello and welcome. I'm Frank Kaufman. I am the director of the Professor's World Peace Academy. And uh, with this, I continue our series uh, interviewing prominent professors internationally on their scholarship and their research. Uh, this evening, I'm very happy to have as my guests, Professor Thomas Ward and Professor William Lay. Uh, these two gentlemen have collaborated on a very important piece of work, a uh, piece of scholarship related to comfort women and international relations in the North, at North Pacific. Um, uh, let me give a word to introduce our professors, and then we will move directly into our program, our interview. Professor Thomas J. Ward is Professor of Peace and Development at Unification Theological Seminary and Distinguished Dean Emeritus at the University of Bridgeport's College of Public and International Affairs. Professor Ward is, Phi Be is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Notre Dame and a graduate of the Sorbonne in Paris. He did his doctoral studies in political economy and international education at the Catholic Insti Institute of Paris and de La Salle University in the Philippines. He teaches graduate courses in international conflict and negotiation and political and economic integration. Professor Ward is a former Fulbright scholar. He has been a guest lecturer at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing and has been a visiting research fellow at Academia's Sinica Institute of Modern History in Taipei, perhaps it's pronounced Sinica, Sinica's Institute of Modern History in Taipei. Professor William Lei is a graduate of Columbia Law School, where he was senior editor of the Columbia Law Review. He clerked for Joseph Bellacosa, Judge Joseph Bellacosa, at the New York Court of Appeals and practiced law with the Fried Frank and Skadden Arps law firms for 12 years before opening his own law office. He now practices law in New York and teaches international and constitutional law at the University of Bridgeport, where he is director of the School of Public and International Affairs. Professor Lei was born in Japan and travels frequently to Korea and Japan. Please join me to welcome them to this evening's interview. Welcome, Professor Lei. Hello, Dr. Kaufman. Welcome. Uh, so once again, we have our fingers crossed for Dr. Ward. Uh, I had him on the phone, and um, we decided to give it another shot here. So we'll wait a few moments. You Are you practicing law presently? Yes. I, I teach uh, at the University of Bridgeport uh, in Connecticut. I also maintain a law practice in New York. Wonderful. Good. Uh, I was going to chew the fat with you on that, but very happily we have Dr. Ward on with us as well. Dr. Ward. How are you, Dr. Kaufman? Fantastic. I'm very good, thanks. I'm very happy to have you with us, and the three of us have uh, conquered the vicissitudes of, of uh, online communications. Everybody's zooming around these days and finding out new ways to be with each other. Uh, thank you for coming on and thank you for allowing me to have some time with you on the, on the, to discuss this matter. I, I've, I've researched what you've written, uh, particularly one of the, uh, one of the main articles uh, what I received from you was two articles. One was on Taiwan. I believe that was a later piece, wasn't it? The, That's correct. Yes. And I believe the one I'm working with is somewhat of a seminal article. The title of it is The Comfort Women Controversy, colon, Not Over Yet. Is that the whole title of that original piece? 
That's correct. Yes, good. And 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 from that, your major work arose. You have you have a book on the market and has has been for some time and has done extremely well on the uh, in on the subject matter. Is that correct? That's correct. Beautiful. Can you just mention the name of that book? Professor Lay, do you want to talk about it a little bit? Okay, it's called Park Statue Politics. And the subtitle is World War II Comfort Women Memorials in the United States. Excellent. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah, yes. It's both the phenomena in the U.S. and to some extent uh, the, the, the underlying phenomenon of the comfort women. Excellent. And I imagine, I think that this article is a good, a good uh, uh, preview. It, it, has, it has a lot of the content that's developed more in depth in the book. Am I correct with that? Or, or, is, or do you depart? I'm, because I'm going to be dealing just with this article with you, uh, with the gen you gentlemen, but the book expands specifically on this or even departs into new territory. It builds on this. I mean, if you want to raise issues with the article, uh, that's, a, that's a good way to proceed. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. So as I said, the title of the article is uh, The Comfort Women, Women Controversy, colon, Not Over Yet. You will have a, a link to this article for uh, hearers to take it in uh, in your own time because it's, it's, it's dense. It's, it's brilliantly written. Uh, by the way, compliments for that. It's brilliantly written. It's uh, uh, very, very complex information, very sensitive information. But the way it's written is, is it communicates well. It, it allows us to be with the issues. Uh, so I really commend you just on the writing itself, the clarity of the piece. But we're here to, we're here, of course, to get into the issues, just for the sake of the, for our listeners, can, can you just in a word or two, I, uh, either one, just if, if there's anybody who's listening that doesn't even know what this word means, comfort women, um, can you just say a word to uh, uh, tee us up for this? Dr. Ward. Yeah, let me, let me say a few things about, uh, about the concept uh, comfort women is a polite way to refer to women who were <clears throat> forced into prostitution uh, during the Asia Pacific War and also prior to that. There is um, a long history, uh, well, obviously all around the world, but there's likewise a long history um, since the beginning of the of the Japanese Empire of uh, sending women overseas. Initially, the women were Japanese, and we're going back then to the uh, uh, to the to the 19th century. We're going back to the beginning of the Meiji reforms, and uh, Japanese women were uh, were were sent overseas. It was a way for them to earn a significant amount of money in a short period of time by essentially uh, serving as prostitutes in. Uh, Japan's new empire, which included uh, Korea, Taiwan, and also uh, parts of China, um, Manchukuo, as it was referred to. And it was in those areas where uh, these women were, were located and they provided certain services. And when World War II, originally the Asia Pacific War, when it began, uh, from that point, there was a recognition of the fact that there were soldiers going overseas and there was a sense that they needed to set up what was referred to as comfort stations. In other words, places where these, these women who were serving as prostitutes, if you will, would be able to uh, locate themselves. And uh, there the soldiers would come on a periodic basis. And essentially, initially the women were Japanese, as I said, but over a period of time, there was concern that this would break down the morale of the Japanese soldiers if they came into a comfort station and they ended up discovering there a sister, a cousin, or another relative who had been recruited into this system. And therefore, at a certain point, uh, the Japanese empire made a decision that the focus would instead turn to uh, other 
women in the empire, the other women in the empire being Koreans and or Taiwanese, and increasingly particularly Koreans as the Asia Pacific War continued, uh, became uh, the main women who were involved in, uh, in this role. Very good, very clear. The, w- were there, at the, ve- at the start of the Asia Pacific War, were there still any Japanese being used for this tragic uh, uh, role? Or had, or had that completely stopped already prior to the Asia Pacific War and World War II? No, there were Japanese women until the end of World War II. It wasn't, until, mm. it wasn't, it wasn't just the Taiwanese and Koreans ever. It was, there were always Japanese women as well. The Japanese women tended to be professional prostitutes. They had made that decision. In the case of the Taiwanese and the Koreans, these were people that had often been recruited under a certain pretense, t- t- being told, for example, that they were going to be able to work overseas as a bar girl, they were going to work as a secretary, they were going to be trained as a nurse, and then finally they found out that they were going to be used basically in the sex industry. I see, I see. Oh, it's so hard to it's so hard to to kind of even discuss in a dispassionate way because it, it tears you up, even just the phenomenon of it itself. Uh, so I apologize. I wish that we could spend spend the next thirty minutes just weeping, honestly. But um, we're here to discuss your research and work, and so apologies to the listeners that it seems to shift, uh, not callously, but uh, you guys have done tremendous work, and and the issue continues today to have not only impact on the lives of the women who have suffered in this way but it's expanded to massive geopolitical realities uh, that continue to play out today. This is right, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes. And that's the, that's the cornerstone of your work. You've introduced a unique angle in the work, which will come up very quickly as we talk. The, uh, as I go through your article, it, the I come across a reference to a December 28th, 2015 agreement between Japan and Korea to, uh, is, is this the last and final and most recent of all efforts to bring to a close the issue of apology, the issue of compensation, the issue of healing international relations? Is that the last formal effort um, uh, by, by states to address this? Uh, I'll leave Professor Lay address that. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, it's the, it's the most recent formal effort uh, to date uh, to put an end to the issue. And you see, our article, which you're focused on here, was published after the, after the agreement, and we said not over yet. I mean, it was predictable uh, that 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 agreement was not going to hold up. I mean, yes. in one sense, uh, the, the Korean government uh, had had entered in, in, in probably you know with good intentions uh, had in, had entered into this agreement without fully getting the the buy in from all the necessary stakeholders, mm. uh, and in particular the comfort women themselves, mm. uh, and it quickly fell apart. I see. I see. We'll get into this later. It seems to me that there were a number of independent non-governmental organizations that that represented a serious wrench in the works of this. Uh, uh, now I learned from you, it seems like a hasty effort on the part of the government. And then, and then non-governmental organizations arose in the wake of that effort. Is, is that, did I read properly or is that? Uh, uh, the AWF, or I can't remember the um, group. Uh, I think you're referring to the Korean Council. And uh, okay. the, mm-hmm. the Korean Council actually had been in place for, uh, for quite some time, actually. It, it, uh, it, it originally began at Iwa Women's University. And that I particular see. council, it, the original area of concern uh, related to prostitution in Korea, and it also related particularly also to uh, uh, Japanese sex tourism. That is, Jap- this, we're talking about in, in the 60s and the 70s, 
uh, Japanese businessmen traveling to Korea on on sex tours in order basically to have to have sex with uh, with Korean women. And mm-hmm. uh, that's where the original concern came. And then as the stories began to emerge, keep in mind that essentially the whole open story about, about the comfort woman only comes to the forefront in the 19 in the early 1990s, where it's recognized as something that did transpire and uh, Korean women and then later Taiwanese women begin to step forward and say, I was a comfort woman. So that is where this begins. And the Korean Council stepped forward as probably the most prominent uh, uh, spokesperson uh, uh, spokespersons for the cause of the comfort women, if you will. Got it. And um, I, please, don't worry, I, I'm headed toward the, the key and unique contribution of your research, which, which is extremely valuable. And I'll get to that just in a moment. But was there, was there a trigger, a particular trigger? I think I recall, was it one woman that kind of tipped the floodgates on this? Or was there a combination of forces that allowed this issue to start to come forward in the 90s? Uh, Professor Lay, do you want to talk about the court case? Kind of just to... Well, we're not at the court case yet, are we? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the first the first woman to come forward. Uh, maybe you can talk about that, Doctor Ward. Well, there was there 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 was a case. It was not, it did not just involve uh, it did not simply involve comfort women. It it involved several plaintiffs. Who were concerned about their about their their situation, and I'm sorry, but in the midst of in the midst of our interview, I don't recall the name of the first woman who came forward. But basically, Kim Hock Sun, Kim Hock Sun was one of the original people to be involved in the 1991 case. But let, let me back up a little bit, okay? If we're going to talk about the legal aspects, okay, uh, we we have to go back to. Uh, obviously, a lot of things happened during World War II. I mean, World War II, uh, the, 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 the Holocaust occurred during World War II. And, and, uh, and, and even at that time, uh, there were people who, who believed that, that the, the, uh, the, the strategy or the philosophy of imposing severe reparations on the losing parties to, to World War I uh, had been counterproductive, uh, and and uh, forcing Germany, for example, to pay severe reparations um, was not a productive approach. And so, as World War II was winding down, the same approach, uh, you know, that sort of thinking uh, affected the the settlement with Japan. Japan was not obliged to pay uh, large reparations for war crimes and other misconduct. Instead, Japan forfeited all of its factories and all of its holdings in all of the um, allied countries and other countries. And so th- that, was, that was a release. That was a release of claims, essentially. Claims were released, and in return, Japan forfeited all its holdings, and Korea was not a party to that because uh, Korea had not been an allied nation in World War II. <laughs> It was actually part of Japan, and so it wasn't involved in the settlement. And and as we discuss, as we discuss in our book, um, uh, the you know the first president of the Republic of Korea, Sigmund Rhee, was extremely anti-Japanese. And it wasn't until you get to the time of Park Chung Hee, who actually had been a Japanese Army officer in World War II, fighting on the Japanese side. Uh, he believed that uh, relations with Japan were extremely important, and so it was in 1965 that the that the uh, settlement agreement or or the agreement establishing relations between Korea and Japan um, uh, came about. And by the way, the U.S. was pushing very strongly because the U.S. was involved in Vietnam and wanted to be able to line up its allies, uh, wanted to settle the problems between Korea and Japan. So. Sorry, but um, so the 1965 agreement uh, purported to release all the claims of civilians against Japan. So the, the Korean government released 
the claims on behalf of all of its people. Now, that's not unusual. That's not unusual for a, uh, a country to take upon itself uh, that, that authority to release individual claims uh, in situations like that. Then the, the, the Japan in turn, uh, uh, Korea in turn received uh, about $500 million worth of benefits. And it should have distributed those benefits to people who had individual claims. But the park government did not do that. They used all of that money to bring about the amazing, miraculous economic recovery of Korea. And nobody was paying any attention to the comfort women then. The U.S. hadn't paid any attention, unlike the, unlike the, the Holocaust, which, of course, was you know, a massive murder of millions of people. Um, women, uh, the, the fate of Korean women was not a high priority. Uh, for the United States at the close of the war. So there was no, there was no real reckoning. There was no, no even awareness. So it all becomes out in about 1991 in the form of a series of lawsuits. And they basically don't go anywhere because of the legal situation that I just explained. The Japanese courts and the American courts both determined that all those claims were released by the Settlement Treaty of 1965. I see, I see. And so, and so this 1991 court case was from a, an individual or a group of people, and it was directed to, yes, go ahead, please. It was a group of, it was a group of Koreans um, who, who uh, had been uh, mistreated, whose rights had been violated by Japan during the war. And actually, um, there were only three comfort women. There were 13 Korean men who had been forced to serve in the Japanese Imperial Army. So even in that initial lawsuit, the focus wasn't really on the comfort women. Uh, but, the, but it was an attempt to, let's say, revive individual claims against Japan. I see. So it, it, was, it was embedded in the texture of... The, the particular international relations of that administration, of that period, it sounds like. And so, yes. That's, yes. Yeah, that's very true. And, and um, you know, and I, I don't want the legal aspect of this to swallow everything up. I mean, it, uh, in the end, uh, okay, you know, legal position is you released all your claims, your government released all your claims, but, but that is not the that is not the end. That is not the solution. That does not deal with all of the feelings and, and unresolved issues. Right. And so, uh, of recent vintage in our, in our very recent months, weeks, and months, the 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 relations between these two countries has degenerated enormously, uh, and naturally, this unresolved matter will become somewhat of a political football uh, on all sides or it not not a political football but the lack of resolution and the sensitivity of the issue that it that it tears you up so fully uh will isn't naturally attractive to people who are trying to force trying to force political uh realities into their uh international relations i i'm i'm guessing i'm thinking is there any truth? Is there any truth to that, or is that an accurate? I think it's well. Maybe Dr. Ward can speak to uh, the way things move once the legal avenues were closed off by unfavorable court decisions. Well, yeah, basically, what we understand is that you know, in, in order in order to change the law one needs to change the culture, which means one needs to change the awareness of what's going on. So as, as, as Professor Lay mentioned, th things, you know, things did, not, did not go legally as they should in Japan, and they made an attempt in America. Also, things did not go as they might, one might have hoped them to go in the United States either. And at, mm. at some point then the realization was that there was the need to do certain things to Bring this to the forefront. It's, it's an amazing story. I mean, if you talk about diplomacy, 
suddenly out of nowhere, the, uh, the, Korean, the Korean council, all of civil society supporting the comfort women, they introduced a piece into, in, into diplomacy that no one had anticipated. And that was, uh, they, for, for years, they did demonstrations in front of the uh, Japanese embassy in Seoul. And, yes. and then at a certain point, they made a decision to place a, uh, a comfort woman statue, a statue of a comfort woman directly in front of that embassy. Right. And everything went crazy because what the what the Koreans had succeeded in doing was to humiliate Japan. Yes. This became a, a, a huge public issue. And they had discovered something. They had discovered something that was going to force Japan to respond when for so long Japan had been silent, had dismissed and said, this is already settled. And suddenly, instead you know, the, um, as they say, the, the, the goalpost had been moved. And the point was, why is this statue here? This is, this is against diplomatic protocols. Why is this being done? What's the, je- what's the rationale for this? And at that particular point, then, everything changes. And the Koreans understood, aha, this is the way that we can be able to advance our cause. It will be through getting the word out through this way. That's the way that everything, everything oh, I changed. See. Through an icon, through through the comfort woman statue, everything changed. I see, and that that goes directly into uh, one of the primary points of your article. And so, it's not so. Um, there's still a lot of of building up the case and building up the information to do here. But uh, let me let me move us a little more. Uh, my, you know, it's all on me here, but a little more aggressively towards uh, the unique contribution of your work. And as a bridge from what you've introduced about this statue in front of the Japanese embassy, um, part of your work is a very elegant and, and non-bombastic way of showing that in a certain way, there's no heroes here. Korea itself had it, is not a, in many ways was not a great defender and protector and champion of its, of its own women. I, I think this comes up in your writing. Uh, the America who's kind of wants to be the holier than thou big power in the, in the, uh, in the tri, trilateral relations here. There, we're not, uh, U.S. people are not the great uh, champions of any particular women on these war scenes. And so um, if you want to, if I can get you to just speak a moment to that, I want to move across to American soil because this is a, an extremely important uh, matter that you introduce in your work. Yes, I think, I think the biggest matter that the big, the, you know, the reality is there are I, probably about 15 comfort women memorials in the United States, perhaps more. I, I haven't checked recently, but there's quite a few of them. And uh, there is also now a curriculum which is being taught, first of all, in the California schools uh, since, I believe, 2017. And I believe it's likewise spreading to other, um, other states, which introduces essentially the Korean narrative of what transpired. And there's, there's, a, lot of truth in, there's a lot of truth in the Korean narrative, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle it. But Yes. There, there are certain things selectively that are not included there, because if those things were included, perhaps uh, the views might be slightly different. And the most important the most important piece that we point out in our work um, is the fact that comfort women were not just used by the Japanese, but comfort women were used by American soldiers. I'm talking about comfort stations, which were used by American so- soldiers from uh, August of 1945 until March of 1946. The same, the, the, the same system was used by American soldiers during that period of time. And that is something that the Korean narrative is silent on because essentially the focus right now is just one country, which is Japan and Japan's wrongdoing. But the reality is that the blame is bigger than that. And that the United States also was 
part and parcel of this for seven months. And then on top of that, you can say 70 years dur during which uh, there has been a tremendous prostitution ring throughout places like Japan, Korea, and the Philippines in order to, uh, to service American military. Not the same as the comfort woman system, but at the same time, still a very demeaning circumstance and situation, which the, which the Korean narrative doesn't speak about at all at this time, because the focus really is a combined effort, in my opinion, between civil society and also certain political forces in Korea to focus upon embarrassing Japan. And, they, in, and in order to achieve that, in order to go forward with that, they do not want to involve the United States at this point. But that's going to come. Yes. Now, um, there's two directions from what you've just said that I want to take us. Um, as soon as, as soon as you see, I can't find what's the word I'm looking for. Like, it's not. It's worse than inconsistencies. It's something like hypocrisy. It's, it's, it's where it's expedient. Expedient to use the thumb screws on Japan and it's just doesn't it's not politically uh, in the in the interests of Korea to bother America but as soon as you see a double standard at work it undermines it undermines your sense that the champions of these women seeking to uh, alleviate or, or I can't find what's the right word to to not compensate but to to vindicate to, to vindicate them when you see the um, double standard one gets suspicious about the entire effort in a certain way it undermines the the care the quality of the care of the women who are supposed to be the object of concern here is that fair to say or or is it a systematic thing first japan american is is it a strategic thing or is there a double standard it feels to me, as I listen to you, like a double standard. Well, yeah, you know, one of the points we make is, it, 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 you know, the, the Korean, each narrative, the Korean narrative and the Japanese narrative uh, has truth in it. Um, and they're both incomplete. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and they, they only lead to more hostility and more confrontation. Um, uh, the Korean narrative leaves out what Dr. Ward just mentioned, which was the, the American, American army using the comfort women system. Uh, it, it leaves out the role of Korean men uh, as procurers for the Japanese military. Um, it leaves out, it leaves out the, the, you know, it leaves out the story of, of, of President Park, as a matter of fact, Park Chung-hee, uh, legalizing prostitution in Korea so that American soldiers would not be spending money in Japan. Uh, and, uh, and actually, uh, he, he glorified the, 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 uh, uh, the sex trade because it brought hard currency into Korea when it needed it. And, and so there's all the, and, and furthermore, uh, it, it, uh, it ignores, let's say, what Korean and Americans did in, in Vietnam to the Vietnamese women. Yeah. So there's all these other pieces. Uh, Ironically, ironically, of course, America, uh, there's, there's, there's also a long history of, of, of sexual uh, violence and, and the military. And, um, and uh, the, the U.S. military is trying to deal with that. There's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of assault in the military. Yeah. Um, there's also a history of prostitution surrounding the military. And, and some of the stories that, that one hears from uh, Eastern European women who end up in, in, uh, in, in brothels in Korea or in the Philippines, it sounds like the comfort women. They, they were told they were going to be waitresses. They were told they were going to have other jobs. Uh, it very much similar to what happened with the comfort women. But, but just to make one more point before I uh, turn it back to you, uh, our book does focus on the situation of municipalities in the United States, such as Glendale, California, or Palisades Park, New Jersey, where you have, you have, uh, you know, uh, relatively unsophisticated uh, mayors and city council people suddenly getting caught up in a dispute between the Koreans yes. and the Japanese. And, 
the, the Korean uh, NGO organizations have been, and, and the Koreans have a, 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 a terrible horror story to tell here. And so it turns out that uh, a lot of times um, the small municipalities are moved in that direction and you end up with comfort women statues in Glendale, uh, California and monuments in Palisades Park and in Long Island and in Fairfax. And as Dr. Ward said, in you know a dozen other places, uh, uh, putting this thing in very stark, um, hostile to Japan terms and causing uh, additional inflammation of the, of the Japan-Korea yes. relations. Yeah, um, excellent. I'm glad, that, I'm glad that by your own kind of creative responses, you were able to bring us to one of the most important elements or perhaps the main thrust of, of, uh, bo- of both your, your research, your observations, and your prescriptions. Uh, as we come to the end, I'd like to, I'd like to give an open floor. And uh, if, if you may, or if, it, if it's a good, good way to uh, open the floor here, the, the role of America and the role of local politics, the role of, as you described, uh, a, a mayor with a high school education or a local Congress council person or something, uh, to that, that dimension of of how how the this issue uh, is being played out on American soil, uh, if you can speak openly about that, and then something that is of interest to me personally in my own research is the matter of the matter of trying to corner corner uh, bad actors uh, with uh, it seems to me it doesn't work. I'm looking at the situation with. Uh, President uh, Xi Jinping of uh, China now, who's who's guilty, pro- very likely guilty of a great uh, a great crime against the world by trying to cover up the spread of the coronavirus. I don't think you can corner corner uh, public figures, and if you have a word to say on how to bring about how to bring make possible the a a a public remorse or an apology. Are, can, can you? Are there ways to make this possible? Because cornering cornering people never works, I believe, and 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 harms genuine progress, which is possible, especially with people. They do want to. They do want to express remorse over t- different historical times when horrible tragedies befell people who are still alive today. So those are two. Two open-ended questions. I'd love to hear from each of you. Well, let, let me say a couple of things that I'd, I'd like to observe. First of all, I think one of, one of the most difficult things for the Japanese is that um, this, the matter of the comfort women first came to the attention of the Japanese in the 1980s through the writings of a... Of a, of a uh, of a Japanese writer whose name was uh, Seiichi Yoshida. And he spoke specifically about comfort women who had been sent out from uh, Busan, and I I believe to China, about 200 some women, and shared shared a whole series of observations about what they went through. Well, based upon the dates and the descriptions that he gave, the Koreans in the Busan area, they came to the conclusion these things didn't happen. We were here. We didn't see that happen. That, that didn't occur. And what eventually transpired is that, you know, major, a major Japanese newspaper, Asahi, had done a number of articles sharing all these things by Seiichi Yoshida. He himself was, you know, wrote an entire book on this topic. And that at some, at some point it became clear that uh, he was not telling the truth. And he eventually said himself, I made this up. This is not Ooh. true. So the Japanese were furious. Can you imagine if you are accused of something by an individual and then it turns out that the accusation is not a valid one? So, of course, they felt justified. They felt vindicated. And then a few years later, along comes uh, another Japanese researcher by the name of 
uh, Yoshimi Yoshiaki, who does an extensive expose and makes it crystal clear based on government documentation from the United States and Japan, crystal clear that this did happen. So the Japanese found themselves in an incredible dilemma. They had been accused, they had been vindicated, and suddenly they were accused again. So it, mm. it was not easy for them to deal with this whole issue because of the circumstances under which it transpired. That made their situation very difficult, if you will. Mm. So anyway, they, they, they're dealing, they're, they're dealing with, with this issue. Uh, and they did come forth with, a, with an apology. But the Korean viewpoint was the apology is not enough. The apology is not, is, is not, uh, is not sincere. And, and uh, repeatedly, they have been asked to apologize over again. You know, mm. it, it has not stopped. So there is that type of dynamic or circumstance which, which is going on. On the other hand, there is, there is another reality, and that is there are forces, there are people who are using this in order to advance their uh, agenda. Most importantly, the last memorial, significant memorial to the comfort women was set up in San Francisco. The main players in that particular effort were not Koreans. They were Chinese. And they weren't just Chinese, but they were pro-Beijing, pro PRC Chinese who were behind that particular initiative. So there is this other broader issue which is going on, and that is an effort to break down relations between the United States and Japan. You know, we mm. did terrible things to the Japanese. It's not just what happened to the Korean women, which are horrible things, but we put the Japanese in detention camps. You know, yes. um, we 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 use Japanese American citizens as for, for hostage exchanges in order to bring back European uh, Americans who had been taken captive by the Japanese. There are things which we did against Japan. And, you know, there's a whole series of things that the United States did against Japan. And yet suddenly the United States forgets about all those things and has allowed things to appear on those statues, which are totally unacceptable. If you go to Glendale, as Professor Lay and I have done, and you walk past the statue there, it says in big, in big print, I was a slave of the Japanese military. Can you imagine? Mm. You know, what, what if, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I, I don't have to give examples, but you, we, you could say those types of things about other groups of people that had been oppressed by white Americans. And, and how would people react if that was the statement which, which stood at the bottom there? Instead of, instead, of, instead of mourning the victims, they're focusing instead on, accuse, on accusing the perpetrators. That's, yes. that's, not a sound, that's not a sound way. So the point is the United States is meant, can play, play an, a, a, an important role, I think Professor Lay and I both feel, by taking responsibility, by expressing our regrets, and hopefully by setting a, a precedent and an example for Japan and for Korea so that reconciliation can occur because these three countries, the United States, Korea, and Japan, they, play, they are all democratic countries. They are all inspired by democratic principles. They play an important role in helping the, the, two, the two countervailing forces in China so that China will have rule of law, China will have democracy, and China will have freedom of religion. Those things are missing right now. And if we can have a real reconciliation where people take responsibility for their wrongdoings, that opens the way also for a, a much brighter future for um, East Asia, for the United States, for the future of U.S., Japan, Korea, even China relations. Yes. Well, thank you extremely for making this uh, relevant and applicable beyond the tragic realities and, and introducing responsibilities that all players bear, including ourselves, even as people. Uh, Dr. Lei, is there any of, uh, of what is left unsaid for a moment or two on your part? Sure, uh, if I may. You know, it's been an interesting experience for Dr. Ward and I. We've, we've met a lot of different people. Uh, we've met and spoken with people who favor the Korean narrative or the Japanese narrative, uh, uh, people who, who have really wondered uh, how this issue could be put to rest. Um, it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult. And when there's been serious wrongdoing, uh, it's almost like no apology yes. is ever enough. 
and and you know what? It's very hard to point and say, well, why don't you, you know, let's look at the successful model of 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 Germany and the Jews, or let's look at the successful model of white America and black America. I mean, you're not gonna it, it we and and the even the even the truth and reconciliation process. Um, of, right. of South Africa, uh, although it, it, it was a noble and great effort, it's it's hard to find really right. shining success right. stories here. So, uh, you know, we're hopeful. We're hopeful that when when everyone's ready to be honest and when everyone's ready to find something good in the other party, um, there can be healing, reconciliation. Uh, Thank you. It's a hard. Thank process. you. Well, this has been. Very fine. I'm very grateful. Uh, I I leave feeling that we've barely scratched the surface, but uh, you've spoken clearly and eloquently. You're on top of your uh, of your own work, and so I think at least uh, myself and the listeners have benefited tremendously from this time with you. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaufman, for inviting us and Thank being you. interested in we'll this. We'll speak again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.